Good morning, jurors. How's everybody doing? You're, you're tired. We, uh, everybody have a seat, please. We moved a, a chair out of each row because only a couple of fortunate people had an empty chair next to them. So we removed the chair out of each row and then spread your chairs out because you guys looked a little tight in there. You, you happier? See, I'm looking out for you. Thank you for coming back. We really appreciate it. Hang in there today. I believe our goal is to really handle one witness. Uh, it's going to be fairly lengthy. And if uh, when we're done is when we'll break uh, for the day. If it's going real long, we may take a short morning break so you can replenish your coffee, whatever you want to do there. And you have enough supplies back there? Everybody's OK? OK, you let me know if there's an issue. And state, who is your next witness? Elise Marquette. Ms. Marquette, come on up. Watch your step. Come all the way through. Once you get around that screen, you're going to face your right hand. Face Mr. Clark for us. All right, you're going to have a seat right up there. Please, please, please watch your step. Once you get in that box, the microphone, the base of it, the top of it, all moves. I need you to get it as close to your mouth, as, not on top of it, but speak directly into the center of it. Because I got a feeling you're going to do a lot of talking towards the jury. Make sure you're talking straight into the microphone. And uh, tell us your full name and then slowly spell it for the jurors, please. Good morning. My name is Elise Yakovone Margetz. My last name is Y A C O V O N E hyphen M A R G E T T S. And if you pull that base towards you, you don't have to bend over. There you go. All right. State, you may proceed. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Please tell us where you're employed. I'm currently employed at the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office in the Forensic Biology Unit. I have a Bachelor's of Science in Biology, as well as a Bachelor's of Arts in Anthropology uh, from the University of Florida, which I obtained in 2010. From there, I continued my education and got a Master's of Science with a concentration in Forensic Science in 2012. Tell us about your um, employment history. After you obtained your uh, Bachelor of Arts, did you begin to work with the Sheriff's Office? Uh, my first job was actually at Broward County Sheriff's Office in 2012 as a forensic technician. Um, I started working at Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office in 2014, January of 2014. Tell us what you did in Broward County as a forensic technician. As a technician, I was responsible for making uh, chemicals used in the DNA process, checking instruments to make sure they were working properly and calibrated. I was also undergoing uh, the DNA training program there, and I was qualified to do serological casework. Does uh, Broward County have its own DNA crime lab, Broward County Sheriff's Office? Yes, they do. And the same with Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office. Do they have their uh, own DNA crime lab? Yes, they do. And what type of training um, program did you go through with Broward? How long was it, and what are some of the um, exercises they put you through? For Broward County? Yes. For Broward County, I completed the serology training program. Um, most training programs are a culmination of lectures, uh, required readings, practical demonstrations, and then hands-on samples for processing. And these samples would be representative of casework. So at Broward, I underwent that training, and I believe uh, they trained me as well as uh, NFSTC, which is the National Forensic Science Training Center. Um, that process was about four months, I want to say. Okay. And you stayed with Broward for two years? Just under two years, correct. And then you moved to Palm Beach County? Yes. And tell us about any training programs at Palm Beach. And what year was that, 2014? Correct. What training programs did Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office put you through? Initially, I underwent a serology training program, which is structured very similar to Broward County's uh, training program. It was about three months. I had samples to test uh, that would be representative of casework, lectures, reading material, practical demonstrations. And at the end of that, I have to take an exam um, to show that I'm proficient in all the testing. So I, um, I completed that. That was about three months. And then in 2015, I started the DNA training program, which is about a year-long training program. Uh, lectures, practical samples to test, reading materials. I also participated in some validation studies during that time. Now let's uh, just uh, go back just a little bit. You said uh, you used the language that you conducted and did 
work on samples that were representative, representative of casework. What does that mean? So samples we see in casework can range from your biological fluids, such as blood and semen, but we also see touch samples. Um, so the samples that are given as practice would be uh, a blood stain or semen stain, but also could be you know, swabs from a doorknob um, and how to process those samples. And are those what, another way to say it, are those mock tests? Yes, those would be mock samples. In other words, did uh, the person who is administering the test to you, did they already know what the answer should be? Correct. And then they gave you the test to figure out to see if you came up with the proper answer? Yes. And did you pass those uh, tests? Uh, yes, so that is how the mock cases worked. In the competency test, it would be something similar where the uh, results are known to the test giver, but not to me as the test taker. Um, so I would have to essentially be graded to make sure I obtained all the correct results. And did you successfully complete the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office uh, first part of the testing you went through training? Correct. And then you said you did some training for DNA. Tell us what that uh, composed of. So the DNA training program was about a year-long program. Um, I had um, samples, again, representative of casework. I had lectures that I had to attend, uh, a long list of required reading, journal articles. I also attended some meetings during that time frame. Um, and at the end of that training program, I had to do a competency test, which involves uh, bench practicals. So those are mock samples prepared with answers that were known to my test giver. And when I uh, had to generate the correct results using our protocols, I had a mock trial and then a written exam as well to make sure I understood the concept and principles behind the science. And the science we're talking about is um, conducting DNA analysis, correct? Yes. You also talked about participating in validation studies. What does that mean? A validation uh, for a crime laboratory essentially is a series of experiments that we will conduct on any new technology or software that's brought into our laboratory to make sure um, that it's working properly, to test kind of the limits of that technology or software, and then we will generate protocols based on our results. So with validations, we create samples, we'll run them through the process, and then we analyze the results to see how did the software work, how did the technology work, and generate protocols based off what we saw so we can examine items of evidence. And did you, um, I don't think I asked you this, did you successfully complete the DNA training part of the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office? Yes, I did. And then did you begin to do work on your own as a, a solo analyst analyzing um, samples of DNA? Yes, I was qualified in January 2016. Now, um, let's talk about the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office Lab. Tell us a bit about that. What, um, what is comprised, when we say the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office Crime Laboratories, what, what's underneath that umbrella? So the Crime Laboratory also uh, has several different divisions. Um, I work in the Forensic Biology Unit. We also have chemistry, toxicology, fingerprints, firearms. Um, so that's kind of the scope of the Crime Laboratory. Now, um, Forensic Biology Unit. How many DNA analysts does the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office employ? So currently, I believe we have six caseworking DNA analysts, but we also have uh, what we call serologists or um, evidence screeners. They will be the ones initially processing the evidence, taking notes, looking for biological fluids, and kind of preparing all the samples so they will be forwarded to D uh, the DNA analyst. Um, we also have several support staff that help keep our laboratory running. One of the was back in 2017. Was she one of the serologists uh, that you just mentioned? Yes. Now, um, tell us about the um, protocols in the lab. In other words, how are you all um, tested or graded on maintaining um, the um, auditing areas of the crime lab? Each analyst has to undergo what's known as a proficiency test, and this is essentially an exam that I have to take two times a year. Um, we have samples that are submitted from an outside vendor. I don't know the results. I use my uh, protocols at our laboratory, generate DNA profiles, and then I submit those results um, to the agency for grading. Uh, I've successfully passed all my proficiency tests. Um, and how about the laboratory itself? Uh, is the laboratory inspected by any outside agencies? 
Yes, so the crime laboratory, we are an accredited laboratory, and accreditation means that we follow internationally set standards for maintaining um, accuracy, quality results in the laboratory. Um, the forensic biology unit additionally has to follow what's known as the QAS standard, quality assurance standards that are set by the FBI, and it's particular for DNA testing laboratories. So with both of those sets of standards we have to follow, we're audited. So we have either an external audit where other experts come into our lab to look at, at um, to make sure we're following the standards, we're following our protocols. Um, or we can have internal audits, so auditors that are qualified have gone through the training program, they can audit the laboratory and make sure we're, do, we're following our protocols and then our protocols are following those international standards. Now, um, how does uh, the individual uh, areas of the laboratory maintain lack of contamination? Talk to us about that. In the forensic biology unit, we have what's called PPE, personal protective equipment. So that's any time you go into the laboratory, you need to gown up, you put on your lab coat, gloves, a hair mask, face mask, and um, goggles. And any time you were to touch an item of evidence, you change your gloves, clean your gloves, you clean your work area before and after evidence. We have uh, procedures that you only examine one item of evidence at a time to make sure uh, that's the item you're analyzing, and then you clean in between. So these are several procedures we have to minimize the risk of contamination. And did you maintain all of those, or do you maintain all of those uh, preventative measures? Yes. Um, have you ever um, in your career been published um, on any of the uh, scientific areas of which you're proficient in? Yes. Uh, recently, I was, I was a collaborator on a paper that was published in the Forensic Science International Genetics Edition for one of the software programs we utilize called StarMix. And are those, uh, is that journal peer-reviewed? Yes, it is. And just explain to us quickly what peer-reviewed means when it, as it relates to scientific journals. Uh, the peer review process is, uh, it goes out um, to the entire scientific community and the community can respond to that. So it's making sure that that paper, um, the experiments are um, repeatable and the paper makes sense. And it's, it's sent out to other scientists prior to publication, is that correct? I believe so. Now, um, we'll talk more about StarMix and the other DNA um, techniques that the laboratory uh, utilizes. Um, I'd like to direct your attention to a PowerPoint that your office um, Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office DNA Lab in conjunction with um, the State Attorney's Office sometimes uses to explain the basic concepts of DNA. Are you familiar with this PowerPoint? I am. And would it assist you in explaining to the jury the basic scientific principles of DNA? It would. And Your Honor, with permission, if I could have a seat while I um, question. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Let's uh, begin. Um, tell us, uh, what is DNA? So DNA stands for deoxyribose nucleic acid. It is the blueprint that provides information on how to create or maintain a body. So this gives you instructions for how to build proteins, but also individualizing features, eye color, hair color, um, if you're lactose intolerant, all of these features are contained within your DNA. Sorry, I just want to ensure the jury can see. Everybody see all right? When the, if there's an issue during the process, just raise your hand. I'll take care of it. All right. Now, um, what do we have? Um, what is listed? What's that graphic there? Explain more to us what that is. So that graphic, DNA, if you might have heard it uh, called as the double helix. Um, so that's a double helix. It's what the molecule actually looks like. And your DNA is wound very tightly into your chromosomes. Um, so humans have 23 chromosomes, and that is... Uh, all of your DNA is wrapped very carefully and packaged in the nucleus of a cell. So that's kind of what that image is depicting. Um, there's a laser pointer up there. Um, if you should. Okay. Right. Um, so that um, this is the double helix, and you can kind of see it winds all around into your little your little chromosome. And that's just one chromosome. Yes, in this example. And what are those letters like that says T A or G C? What does that mean? Uh, these are the base pairs, 
And the combination of these base pairs will determine it's essentially the coding for how to build a protein or your eye color. Um, there's four base pairs that are known, A, um, A, T, G, C, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. Um, and with these four base pairs, we're able to create millions of proteins. And um, tell us now, um, you told us already a little bit about where DNA is located, but let's get more specific. Where is DNA located in the human body? So your human body is made up of cells, cellular material. Um, this is a depiction of the cell. You can kind of think of it as a fried egg. Um, so you have this light blue portion that would kind of be your egg white. So that's where all the mechanisms to help um, keep the cell alive running. Uh, the yolk of the egg is actually the nucleus. So that's where all that genetic material um, that tells your body how to build proteins uh, lives. So you have this little chromosome here, and it's the similar image as before, where you kind of see it unwinding into that double helix structure, into the smallest um, unit of DNA, which is your base pairs. And um, where is, uh, we talked about specifically where DNA is located, but in your body, but what types of bodily fluids can we find DNA? So DNA can be found in any nucleated cell. Uh, so you have, there's some examples up here, hair, skin, bone, blood, specifically your white blood cells, uh, kidney, saliva, um, cheek cells in particular. Um, we use those for reference standards a lot of the time. Um, sperm cells, and if you have brain tissue, any sort of body tissue as well. And the main point for here is that all of these areas are gonna generate the same DNA profile, which is why we're able to compare maybe a blood stain left behind at a crime scene to a cheek swab of an individual and make sure that those DNA profiles, they're the same profile. Um, let me give you a hypothetical. If I'm, uh, if I, say if I break into a home and I cut my finger as I'm breaking into the home and I drop some blood on the floor, but also within the home, I'm grabbing items and I'm sweating and, and I'm touching things. If someone came and swabbed and sent those samples to the DNA lab, would my DNA profile be the exact same in the blood that I dropped, as well as the touch DNA, the DNA you're getting from me sweating on something? Yes, it would. Same profile, right? Same profile. Regardless of where it comes from in the human body? As long as it's the same person, yes. Okay. Um, actually, just going back, just one thing. You said DNA can be found in the skin. We might talk about it further further up in the PowerPoint, I can't recall, but how is DNA found in the skin? What is that? Is that skin cells? Right, so skin cells is what we commonly call it. There's epithelial cells, so there's um, skin cells that you leave behind when you touch an item. Okay. Now tell us, uh, where does a human being get their DNA from? Uh, so the DNA that we look at at PBSO, it's really known as nuclear DNA, um, and it's inherited equally from both parents. So you get half your DNA from mom, half from dad, um, and um, this combination creates a totally unique individual, unless you have an identical twin. Um, identical twins are the only individuals with the same DNA profile. Uh, why is that? Because uh, identical twins, it's particular, they share... Uh, they share an egg during fertilization, it's the same egg, the same sperm cell, and then that splits. So it's essentially the same genetic material being split into two individuals. But fraternal twins, not identical, fraternal twins come from two different uh, components, correct? Correct. And so their DNA is not going to be the same, right? Correct. All right, that's why they don't look alike sometimes, right? Correct. Um, okay. So only identical twins have that same nuclear DNA profile. So again, this is just an image of that cell. You have mom and dad that will combine their DNA to create um, a unique individual. And that nuclear DNA profile is what we look at at Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office. And uh, within the scientific community, um, other people who are doing DNA analysis, are they also looking at nuclear DNA? Yes, um, there's several varieties of DNA, so um, for identification, usually nuclear, but there's also this mitochondrial DNA you inherit from your mother. There's known as um, Y STRs or Y chromosome that you inherit from your father. So there's several varieties, but um, we look at nuclear DNA for the most part. Um, let's talk about DNA. 
how else it's used in the in the scientific field. We always hear about it generally just in the forensic field, like on TV, the CSI, things like that. But tell us scientifically how DNA is used throughout the world. Um, so DNA is used worldwide in many, many different fields. So you have examples like mass disaster identification, um, uh, disease research, organ transplants to make sure there's compatibility, uh, prenatal testing to make sure uh, the embryo is developing normally, uh, prescription drug manufacturing, war casualty identification. Um, so soldiers that are left behind, if they can't identify them, they'll try to use DNA um, to help with that. Paternity testing uh, is quite popular. And then DNA profiling in criminal and civil cases. Um, just going back to a few of them, like prenatal testing. Um, is DNA used in tests such as like an amniocentesis? Yes. Okay. To test the DNA of a baby when they're still in, um, inside the mother? Yes. Okay. And the scientific principles of DNA, the scientific principles we use DNA for in the forensic area, is it the same scientific principles that are used uh, when DNA is used in all of these other scientific areas? Yes, it's the same um, fundamental science. And is that fundamental science um, accepted within the worldwide scientific community? Yes. Talk to us now about how we've, we've learned about where DNA is in the cell, how it's created. How does and how did you extract DNA from um, cells or blood or different items? Uh, so there's five basic steps in forensic DNA analysis, and we'll go through each one. Um, but just an overview, the five steps are extraction, quantification, amplification, DNA detection, and then DNA interpretation. Let's talk about extraction. What does that mean? So extraction is step one of the DNA process. Um, in this image, you can see you have an item of evidence. Um, and there is an individual taking a sample of that item of evidence. Uh, for our laboratory, this would be the serologist most likely collecting those stains um, for DNA processing. Could that also be um, if swabs come in from a different agency, say someone swabs an item, they package it up and they forward it to the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office DNA lab. Could that then be the extraction you're extracting from that swab? Yes, so on the extraction process, we would take a cutting of whatever material, so be it the t-shirt or a swab that was submitted from a different agency. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so we will take a sampling of that material and we add some chemicals and some heat uh, to break open that cell. So in this picture, you can kind of see that this is a cell and that's that kind of fried egg and the pink is the egg yolk or the nucleus of the cell. So what our goal is, is to break open that nucleus releasing the DNA. Um, in this process, we also kind of clean up, remove any extracellular debris there. So at the end, we're left with a, a tube of liquid and it has a pure or purified DNA um, from the nucleus of the cell. And that's what we call our DNA extract. Extract. Okay. And this process of extraction, um, is this something that only the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office Lab does or is this the general scientifically accepted um, method of extracting DNA? Uh, yes, this is essentially how you would extract DNA in almost any laboratory. And all the scientists uh, worldwide do it this way? To my knowledge, yes. Quantification, what does that mean? So quantification, step two. This is now where we are gonna ask the question, did we obtain any DNA from that extract? Um, and if we did, how much did we get? Um, and is the sample even human DNA? Um, so this, we're going to take a very small sampling of the extract. We go through a process um, known as PCR, polymerase chain reaction, where it makes millions of copies. If you think it's kind of like Xeroxing that DNA extract so we can actually see it. Um, so the quantification that results from the DNA extract we have a threshold where we have to have enough to continue in the process. So this is um, step two of five. If there's not enough um, DNA that was obtained, we're not going to continue in the process because there's just not enough DNA to continue. Um, but these are the two questions that quantification answers. Did we get DNA and then how much? And just to uh, make sure all of these steps that we're talking about in this case that you were assigned for which you're testifying about, 
did you follow these steps and procedures in obtaining uh, DNA? Yes, our laboratory has um, very detailed protocols on how to conduct each step of this process. Right. Did you adhere to strictly to all of those? Yes, I did. Uh, what's amplification mean and why do you do it? So amplification is step three. We kind of used it in step two a little bit during quantification, but amplification as uh, the third stage in DNA analysis, again, we utilize that polymerase chain reaction because we're gonna take what was extracted in step one and we're gonna Xerox uh, that uh, DNA and make millions and millions of copies. Um, so we go through quite a number of cycles. I believe we go through 30 cycles. Um, and we're, at the end of it, we have millions of copies, but also those copies of DNA, we're just looking at specific areas of your DNA, and we're putting little fluorescent tags so we can see it in detection. Um, uh, so it targets specific region of the DNA varying in size, and, oops, sorry, I can't see that. Um, so we'll get a complete DNA profile if all the target regions are copied successfully. And number four, DNA detection. So this is the stage where we can finally see if we obtained any a DNA profile and what it looks like. So this instrument here, this is known as a capillary electrophoresis. It's the instrument that we use to help detect. Um, and this is an electropherogram. These are the results that I look at, look at day in and day out. This is a DNA profile. So you can see the little peaks here. Um, those are known as uh, alleles. They're variations of DNA at the particular marker we're looking at. Um, but this is a DNA profile, and I would be comparing to a DNA profile like this from evidence or reference standards. Um, DNA interpretation, we're going to give examples too um, a little bit later, but tell us what step five is. So after I obtain that electropherogram, I now have to interpret it. So now I, I leave the lab, I go back to my desk, and I'm looking at my computer to determine um, some of these questions. So first, I do an overall quality assessment of the profile. Did I obtain enough DNA to really even make a comparison? Is there enough information there? Um, the next question, is the DNA from one person, or maybe it's more than one person, what we call a mixture? Um, so we have profiles that come from one and only one. If we remember, your DNA is from uh, mom and dad, so at most you would have two pieces of information, um, but if I see more than two pieces of information, that's indicative of a mixture. Um, and then if I obtain a mixture, right, so there's multiple people, if I do a swab from a door handle, multiple people touch that, maybe I'm picking up multiple uh, contributors, how many contributors are there? Um, so this is kind of the assessment that I do on the evidence um, before I look at any sort of reference standards, I look at the evidence first. And once I make all of my conclusions on the evidence, um, then I will compare to any standards that I have in the case to see are there any individuals that cannot be excluded? Do they, for the information I have in the evidence, when I compare, do they match? If they do, then I have to provide a statistic to kind of um, provide weight to that inclusion. And when you're talking about comparing people, talking about comparing DNA profiles, correct? Correct. Now let's talk and, and tell us uh, what unknown evidence is and reference standards are. So your unknown evidence is going to be what was submitted from a crime scene. A blood stain, swabs of a door handle, we don't know uh, who touched or the origin of that DNA sample. So that's the unknown evidence. The reference standards come from a particular person. So when a reference standard is collected, typically it's two Q-tips. You'll rub on the inside of your cheek to, to collect those cheek cells. We conduct the same DNA process that I just explained, and then a profile is obtained, and it's single source. It's from one person, and I know who that profile came from. And so let me give you an, uh, another hypothetical, same hypothetical before. Um, I break into a house. I drop some blood on the scene but nobody knows it's me yet, because I lied, poor police team. Crime scene comes, they swab that blood. Still don't know whose it is, but they submit it to you. Um, for whatever reason, I become a suspect in a case. Um, you want to know what my DNA profile is. I'm the suspect. So am I then, you come to me, someone comes to me and takes a reference sample, a known DNA profile from me, correct? Correct. Is that what a reference sample is? Yes. And an unknown evidence, that 
blood drop that you had, you've already conducted DNA on it, right? Correct. You then compare my known DNA profile, my reference standard, to that unknown evidence DNA profile to see if they match. Correct. All right. Tell us now what, um, and if you can, if you can't see, you can step down, but I'd like to go through this sample um, and tell us um, on, under the unknown evidence column, there's 22 genetic markers and then we're using a stain on the pants. So take, this, take us through this as if this were a real case. So the 22 genetic markers, these are the particular areas that we're looking at of the DNA for comparisons. You can think of them as little GPS locators on your DNA. Um, these are kind of scientific lingo for where to find this particular marker in, the, uh, in your DNA profile. So we have these 22 areas. Now we look, and this is kind of uniform, we use a commercial kit, so we always look at the same areas of DNA. And is this looking at these areas, or have these areas that you're looking at on the DNA, like area number one, it's called AML, right? Mm -hmm. And then area number two, DS51358. Have these specific locations been validated within the scientific community to say these are good locations to look at to obtain DNA profiles? Uh all the locations here have been thoroughly vetted in the, uh, not only the scientific community, but the forensic science community as well, um, that these are the areas that provide, uh, they're commonly used in forensic profiling. Okay. Um, so um, in this uh, hypothetical, you have a stain on a pair of pants like that was left at a crime scene, correct? Yes. So what are you doing now with this unknown evidence? Tell us what this is showing. So in my DNA interpretation, that's step five, I'm going to look at this DNA profile. And the first thing I have is, do I have enough information? Yes, I think um, there's information at every single marker, which is good. How many people would this be? So I don't see any more than two pieces of information at a particular marker. And to me, that's indicative that this really just belongs to one person. So this stain, um, there's one contributor. It's also known as single source. Um, so that I do first. I make sure I examine the evidence, make my conclusions first. Uh, when you say first, meaning you're, you're um, analyzing the unknown evidence and obtain, going through that five-step process to see if you can get a DNA profile and get a, a strong enough one to make a comparison later, if you ever get a reference sample, correct? Correct. Okay. That first one, a AML, it says XY. What is that marker? So AML is short for amylogenin, um, so it's actually a sex determining marker. This can tell me if the sample that I obtained is male or female. In this example, there's an XY, and that's indicative of a male profile. Females would be XX. So if I drop some blood at a crime scene, I'm female, it would come out XX. You're able to tell the sex of the person. Yes. Okay. Um, tell us then and show us the example for the reference standards. In other words, how is it? If you get reference standards in a case, how is it that you then compare them against unknown evidence and make a determination if somebody's DNA profile matches? So in this example, I have my evidence. I've run my reference standards, so now I'm going to do my comparison. And essentially what the comparison is, is I go line by line. All right, my evidence is a 1718. So I'm going to look at person one. Person one is also a 1718. Okay, can't exclude them. I go down, I believe that's a 1213, person two is 1213. And I go down each one, and I, I can't exclude. There, there's no difference, they match everywhere. So at this point, person one cannot be excluded. So I would know I have to provide a statistic for a weight of this match. When you say person one cannot be excluded, meaning they cannot be excluded as, as matching the unknown evidence. Correct? Yes. Okay. Um, let's go to person two. So you have two, two known samples. Tell us if person two can be excluded. So person two, again, I look at my unknown evidence first. Unknown, I have a 1718 at the first marker. Person two is a 1618. Okay, that's different. Um, I'll keep going down. 
I have a 1213, they're an 1115. That's not a match. So going down, they're excluded, meaning there are differences in the unknown and the reference profile that can't be explained by science. So they're excluded. They're different information. They don't match. They're not a contributor to the stain on the pants. So when you say you, you go down, you look, are you looking marker by marker? Yes. Or location by location. And then you're, you're seeing if they're matching on locations and if they can be excluded, you're excluding them out as having left that evidence on the pants, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, you know, let's talk about the difference between a single source and a mixture. A lot of times on TV shows we see, oh, there's one person left their DNA and that's it. Do we often have mixtures of DNA on items? Yes, I would say the majority of what I analyze are mixtures. As the science of DNA becomes even more and more advanced and evolved as we go on month by month, year by year, and it becomes more specific, are we beginning to see even more mixtures? Yes. Okay, we'll talk more about that. But tell us now um, about mixtures of DNA. So the example on the stain of the pants, that was single source that came from one person. Now, if we look at this example, um, so let's say this is swabs of a hat. This does not look like one person. There's more than two pieces of information. In fact, the most you see is five pieces of information, and that would really be indicative of three people. Um, so this is a DNA mixture of at least three people. I would make a determination to see, is it three? Is it more than three? In this case, um, it's indicative of three and only three people. All right, so let's just break it down in this hypothetical. If um, there was a hat left at a crime scene, the crime scene investigator swabs it, forwards the swabs to you. Is this you then extract, going through the five-step process for unknown evidence, extracting a DNA profile from those swabs? Is that what we're looking at? Yes, and I should just, I just want to mention um, these numbers that we're looking at. These are particular, uh, they're called alleles, but they're variations of that particular marker. So maybe your mom gave you, um, at this marker, 13 pieces of information, and your dad gave you 16. So that's just what the numbers mean. I, I didn't explain that before. And when we're looking at um, in that other slide that we had, the different, you call them GPS locations on the DNA, is that what we're looking at here? Yes, these would be the, the same. Not, the names of the locations aren't on the side of this one. It's laid out exactly like that, correct? Correct. All right. And this is indicating to you that there's a mixture of three people. Yes. Meaning three people's DNA was picked up on those swabs of that hat. Correct. Okay. Um, what do you do when you have a mixture? So we have a mixture, and now I want to see, can I pull apart that mixture? Is there maybe one person contributing more? So an example would be if you were to take um, 10 drops of my blood and maybe one drop of someone else's blood. I'm contributing more to that stain. So you would expect to see my profile at a higher um, height than maybe that person that only contributed one drop of blood. Um, so this is a process known as mixture deconvolution. We used to do this um, manually, calculators, pen, paper, um, showing on the profiles, you know, these are the pairings that I think go together to pull apart this mixture. Um, so we are able to interpret uh, mixtures of two, three, and four. In 2017, we have a software program known as StarMix to help us pull apart that mixture. So if you think of a mixture, if you have you know, a handful of coins, this is a mixture. There's ver um, different coins, different sizes, different compositions. And what um, StarMix helps us do is pull apart that mixture into the individual components. So then I can see person one, person two, and person three. Um, their DNA profiles that are contributing to that mixture from the swab from the hat. Let's talk uh, generally about StarMix. Um, you said it was a software program. Prior to, when did it, uh, uh, when did Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office begin to use it? Uh, StarMix came online at PBSO at August 2017. And it relates to mixtures, is that correct? Yes, it's a tool that helps the analyst um, pull apart the mixtures, and it also calculates uh, statistics for us in the form of what's known as a likelihood ratio. Prior 
of two star mix coming aboard Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office Crime Lab. If we wanted an analysis done like this via a software, via a computer to do the mathematical work for us, um, what, what would the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office do for us? Would you send out to other laboratories who utilize this uh, scientific procedure? So before StarMix, we had what's known as there were interpretation guidelines from our validations. So we did all those experiments and created guidelines on how we could deconvolute a mixture. But sometimes certain mixtures did not meet those qualifications. They didn't meet those guidelines. So we would um, we could send it out maybe to someone that had that ability to do. So if you think about it, it's like tools in a toolbox. We didn't have that particular tool, but other labs could. So that was always an option depending on the profile that we obtained. This scientific principle of mixture deconvolution. Is that something that the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office um, discovered or has, is this within the scientific community worldwide that's been accepted? Deconvoluting a mixture has been around since the beginning of forensic DNA analysis. Um, the technology, the mathematical principles, the, the computer capabilities have just evolved um, since the inception of forensic DNA analysis so that um, programs like StarMix, which can calculate a lot more um, modeling, more sophisticated algorithms, that um, it allows that sort of deconvolution. But deconvoluting a mixture has been around for years. Okay. And um, has StarMix, is Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office the only laboratory that uses StarMix uh, computer program? No, I believe on my next slide I have a little bit about more StarMix. Um, Sorry, it's okay. It's okay. Tell us more about StarMix. Um, so to answer the last question, um, currently there's 45 labs in the U.S. that are using it, um, and then there's 20 labs internationally um, that are using it as well. Um, it was developed by the um, Environmental Science Research Agency in New Zealand, and it's kind of um, become one of the most widely used mixture deconvolution softwares. Um, so what is it? Uh, it's a probabilistic genotyping program which aids DNA analysts in mixture deconvolution, which we just talked about, um, and then statistical calculations. So how does it do this? Uh, it uses biological modeling, statistical theory, computer algorithms, and probability distributions to um, infer genotypes, uh, allele combinations. Could this be, could this uh, be the genotype for that first person in the mixture? Um, and it calculates statistics. So that's kind of what we use it for at PBSO. It's a tool to help us pull apart those mixtures. Uh, the statistical, um, and I asked you this before, I think, and uh, let me get a little further in depth, but the statistical mathematical theory behind all of these calculations and the probability distributions, are these all concepts that are firmly rooted within the scientific community and the mathematical community? Yes. They're a litany of papers about the modeling that it uses in peer-reviewed journals. Um, it's, it's widely reviewed um, and accepted. And when we talk about peer-reviewed and scientific journals, um, if I just wanted to write a science paper and I just kind of scribbled it out and threw it over to one of the scientific journals, are they automatically going to publish it or is there a rigorous process that they go through before they're going to release it? scientific community? There is def there's a process to go through. I'm not familiar with the step-by-steps, okay. but there's a process. You can't just submit anything. Um, talk to us about the, the last step, statistics. What does that have to do with DNA uh, interpretation and profiling? So statistics, that helps uh, me communicate the weight of that match or that individual that cannot be excluded. Um, the more, <clears throat> excuse me, the more information that I have, the higher weight of a scenario or the more rare that profile is. So you know that, okay, this is, uh, there's more weight to this profile. Um, and so it gives significance to the DNA profile. <clears throat> Do you want some water? I'm okay, thank you. Um, a little bit more about that. So then this slide is referring to, okay, I have to tell you how significant that profile is. Um, how, how common is that profile in the population? Um, 
I like to think of it as if I were to go searching for a car, you know, I need to know enough information to kind of narrow my search so I know what I'm looking for. If I tell you we're going to go car shopping and I just want a sedan, I mean, that's a lot of choices. That's not, um, thank you. That hasn't narrowed down my search very much. But if I have more criteria, I want a sedan that's blue, four doors, a Lexus, 2018. The more criteria I have, the more um, narrow my search, the higher significance of a car I'm looking for. That's kind of um, what statistics are helping you do. So how do we determine how common a profile is? Um, essentially, we're going to have to test a slice of the population to see um, how often each piece of information occurs in that population. And when we're talking about how often each piece of information occurs in the population, are we going back to that chart? Are we going back to those GPS locations? Is that what you're talking about? Yes. In other words, how many locations are you looking at? Um, we look at 22 markers. All right, so looking at 22 markers, if you go to marker 19, you want to see how often, how many people in the population have that same location data on marker number 19, right? Correct. And then you do that for all of the markers, right? Yes. What is that? There we go. Oh, I guess this one is click. It's okay. <laughs> um, okay. That's good. Um, so the database that we use, um, we don't have our own database anymore. We use um, NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology. Um, so they're the ones that actually went out, collected many, many um, profiles from volunteers of several different groups. So we have Caucasians, Hispanic, and African Americans. Those are the groups that uh, PBSO reports. Um, so this database, so they collected all the samples, they ran the samples, they analyzed, okay, how many times did I see um, this particular piece of information uh, in this group? Um, this database has been published in peer-reviewed journals, um, and the data gathered gives us an estimate of how often that DNA occurs in the population. So for example, we have 100 people that we tested their DNA, and at a particular piece of information, at one marker, it's seen 12 times. So 12% of the time, that population, they should have about 12% would have that piece of information. So that's kind of how the databasing works. And we use that in our statistics to tell you how significant a match is. Um, so these DNA frequencies, they're used to give significance to inclusions um, using a calculation called the product rule. Um, there's a next slide, which could help me. And this is all now. All this is relevant to what we're talking about right right now is the last, very last step that we give to juries, statistics. Yes. Right? Okay. Tell us the product rule. So the product rule, essentially it gives frequency of the DNA profile. Um, so how common is that DNA profile in the population, right? How much information do I have? How rare is the information that I have so I can narrow that search? Um, or what are the chances of finding this DNA profile in the population? Um, so an example of the product rule would be um, if you are going to throw a pair of dice and you want um, both sides two fives. So what is that probability? So each probability, well, there's only one five on the six-sided dice, so it's one out of six, but you want to throw two die, and one doesn't depend on the other. They're independent. Um, so you would multiply, multiply the probabilities of each event, and you would get 2.8% uh, of the time um, you would expect that result. So that's just a little demonstration of the product rule. Um, we do that with the population frequencies that we see in the population databases we use. And is the product rule, is that just a, a, a very basic mathematical concept that has scientific acceptance within the mathematical field? Yes. And um, go ahead and just tell us what these are. Uh, so two tools that are available at PBSO, um, uh, would be the, it's called random match probability, but this really answers the question, how common is a DNA profile in the population? Um, would I expect to see, you know, one, I would expect to see this profile one in 300 individuals, that type of statistic. Um, so that's known as random match. And now there's another uh, statistic called a likelihood ratio, which is a little bit different, and I have a slide explaining, but this is, um, can you hit the button one more time? I think something's missing. Oh, no. Sorry, um, a likelihood ratio essentially is saying how likely is an explanation for the DNA profile that I obtained. 
All right, these are some of the statistics we're mm -hmm. going to be hearing um, coming up as we go through the work you did in this case, correct? Correct. And um, tell us about random match probability here. So random match probability, that's the first one that says how common a DNA profile is in the population. Um, so again, you, we could have results of, well, it's, I would expect to see this profile in one in 400 individuals. Um, so I would report that number. But there is a threshold. If frequencies are more rare than one in 300 billion individuals um, for all three populations, um, I'm just going to report um, the profile obtained is more rare than one in 300 billion individuals. And I think we have a slide that, yeah, here we go. <laughs> so in Palm Beach County, we have approximately 1.4 million. In Florida, there's about 20 million people. The U.S. is 328. The world is 7.5 billion individuals. Um, so a statistic of one more rare than one in 300 billion is many, many times the population of the world. And um, you talked a bit about likelihood. So the other statistic um, I utilized in this case is a likelihood ratio. Now, it's a little bit different than the one we just talked about. It doesn't really have to do with the population of the world. It's two scenarios um, to explain the DNA profile. So um, it explains, it compares two different explanations for the DNA profile. And it provides a number, and that number gives weight to the explanations. So kind of just to walk through, this is the statistic we report. So the DNA profile that I obtained. Right, there's two scenarios. Did that DNA profile come from Jane Smith and John Doe? So that is explanation one. Or did the DNA profile come from Jane Smith and some unknown individual? So those are the two scenarios. And the likelihood ratio provides a number, and that's the weight. So that number can be a likelihood ratio of one, which means equal support for both. Each explanation could happen. The larger that number gets, the more uh, the scales kind of tip in the favor of one explanation over the other. And we're talking, this likelihood ratio is going to come into play when we're talking about mixtures, right? Correct. So this star mix is giving us likelihood ratios. Correct. And in this particular case we're going to talk about, you used both due to the time frames that happened. The first part of your analysis was prior to StarMix coming aboard, correct? Yes. And then once StarMix came aboard, you reran some of the samples. So we're going to be dealing with both um, analysis, correct? Correct. Go ahead. Uh, so just um, to explain a little bit um, for the likelihood ratio, this is how we set it up. So again, as did person A contribute or did someone else contribute? Those are the two explanations. So the larger the number for the likelihood ratio, the more likely that explanation. So I said a likelihood ratio of one is equal weight for both, but you can see um, maybe you have a likelihood ratio of 100. Okay, it's a little bit bigger, um, but now you have, ooh, 100,000. Oh, wow, then we have this number here, which is one, one times 10 to the 16. Um, so sometimes the numbers are so large, uh, we don't report the whole number. We'll report it in scientific scientific notation, I'm sorry, um, where it's actually this number, so one, um, followed by, you move that decimal place over 16 times, fill it with zeros, and that's the number. So sometimes we get numbers quintillions, decillions, just very, very large numbers, and that is um, very strong weight for that explanation. Um, oops. We, we're jumping now back to um, one of the earlier processes of DNA detection, okay? So if I'm sending you, if somebody sends you, let's just use those pair of pants as an example. And they think, you know what, we think somebody left this pair of pants at the crime scene, there might be some evidence on it, we want you to analyze it. Are you always going to find DNA on an object? No, not always. And what are some of the factors that could inhibit you finding a DNA profile? Um, so this slide is in reference to like if an individual were to particularly touch an item of evidence. So some factors that affect will you leave a DNA profile by? profile behind, um, the length of time an item is touched. If you hold an item longer, there's more opportunity for your skin cells to transfer onto that item. So this laser pen that I've been holding, I probably have left some DNA behind. Um, also, the surface of an item. Items that are rougher, this has uh, like a textured grip, that would uh, 
kind of slough off more of your skin cells, leaving skin cells behind. Um, and also, there's the factor of the person touching the item. Some people just leave their DNA behind more readily than others. Let me just jump to one area so I don't forget it. Shell casings. Um, in talking about the ability to obtain DNA profiles from items, um, are you familiar with the process of how a gun is fired? The heat that goes through it once, it's, once the projectile is shot out the barrel? Yes. And does heat oftentimes inhibit DNA or destroy DNA? Yes, so um, heat, especially in the firing process, it's so hot it can break down that DNA so that we can't um, obtain any DNA. In the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office Lab, because of that scientific principle, um, do you all not even test shell casings that come to you? Correct, um, we don't do shell casings. Uh, we actually had an intern uh, look at this process. Um, some of papers, like the peer-reviewed papers we were mentioning, published their process. We replicated it, and we just did not have good results. So we don't we don't do those. If a crime scene analyst at a crime scene sees a bunch of shell casings, they collect them, they swab them for DNA, give you the swabs, and you're trying now to extract some DNA out of that swab. Have you all had terrible results in getting DNA from fired shell casings? With the study that was done, yes. Okay. Um, tell us some more of the um, inhibitors and uh, degradation of DNA. Um, so this is the last slide. So essentially, it's not just you touching an item. It's also the condition, the environmental conditions for where that item was found. So factors that may decrease or prevent detection of a DNA profile. So you have inhibitors, things like uh, chemicals from your clothing, melanin from tissue and hair, um, sometimes even soil, like the acid in the soil. These can make it harder to obtain a DNA profile. Um, so there are some very common inhibitors that's part of our validation study as well to make sure we test and, um, the common inhibitors and see if our kit can handle that. But we don't know all inhibitors. Um, so that's something we're trained with, part of our training to look for. Um, there's also a mechanism known as degradation. So this is where your environmental exposure randomly breaks apart the DNA into very small pieces and I can no longer detect that DNA. So one example is heat. If an item is left in the sun for days, weeks, months, um, that sun is just beating down on the DNA, breaking apart the DNA, so I can't detect it anymore. Um, there's also bacteria, molds. They like to chew at the DNA so it's not detectable. Um, we have enzymes and even certain chemicals um, can just break down DNA uh, that you will not be able to obtain a profile anymore from that, uh, that sample. Um, just a few more general questions about uh, the ability to um, detect DNA. No. And why not? Um, so obtaining a DNA profile, it has to do with the length of time it was touched, um, how often it was touched, um, the surface, the individual. Maybe if also if you like, cleaned your hands recently, you're not going to be leaving as much DNA behind. So there's a lot of factors that leave um, how often a DNA profile can be obtained from uh, touch items or skin cells left behind. Yes, so all the examples that we looked at, those were complete DNA profiles. I had information at every GPS location I was looking at, um, but sometimes I don't have information everywhere. And that's what we call a partial profile, where there's information missing. Um, it's known as allelic dropout, um, but there's just information missing. It's not represented in the profile. So that would be a partial DNA profile. Are you guaranteed to get a 
full DNA profile from you. We need information on every, is it 22 locations? Yes. Information on 22 of those categories, of those locations. Are you guaranteed to get that from me? I'm touching it fully. No. Again, all, all the factors that I mentioned, it's, it's just the nature of the sample left behind. If you don't leave enough behind um, for detection, if there's not enough skin cells to sample from in that extraction process, I'm not gonna obtain a complete DNA profile or even, maybe even a DNA profile at all. And same example, what if um, I put gloves on? I put gloves on, I haven't touched that pen today. I put gloves on and with my gloves, From the pen, no, because there's a physical barrier now between your skin and the item that you're touching. Um, you were the DNA analyst um, that was assigned uh, to do the uh, work on this case, is that correct? Yes. And it's uh, your PDSO case number 10270, correct? Yes. We've got a lot of different numbers here that we'll pull together at the very end of the case because we've got Jupiter Police Department exhibit numbers, we've got PDSO exhibit numbers, and then we've got court exhibit numbers, correct? Yes. Okay, so let's go through, though. Did the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office Laboratory assign its own submission number? Yes, any evidence that comes into our laboratory gets its own unique um, identifier, its submission number um, for our laboratory tracking system. Got a few, and whenever Ms. Simpson gets a chance, um, we'll just flip it over to the LMO and don't hurry to go. Um, did you author um, several reports in this case? Yes, I believe it's six total. When you're doing your work as a DNA analyst, um, are you taking or did you take extensive notes um, for each process of your scientific? Uh, I do document all my interpretations and um, uh, for the entire process. And you have what you call as an extensive case file, is that correct? Yes. Did you then make that um, case file available to the state and to the defense? Yes. Um, after you complete your analysis, did you then um, uh, prepare detailed reports of all your findings? Yes. So let's talk about, we know that star mix the likelihood ratio one that helps us interpret mixtures. That came on board in uh, August 2017. Did you conduct analysis prior to August of 2017 in this case? Yes, I believe there were three rounds of DNA before August 2017. So let's begin with your report that's dated May 21st, 2017. Okay? okay. And I think the easiest way is go line by line through your report and you can tell us what items you received, what you did with them, and what your results were. Okay. Um, submission 17, did you receive two blood standards from a Sean Henry? Uh, yes, I did. And let me ask you, you work in conjunction with Deanna DaCosta, correct? Yes. So her role in this process was what? So uh, Deandra DaCosta, she was the serologist, so she received all the physical items of evidence, documented their packaging, their condition, um, essentially took extensive notes for, uh, of those items of evidence. She would transfer anything that was gonna be forwarded to DNA to a sealed, or a, I'm sorry, a manila envelope, label it with the case information, what it is, um, and that gets put into what's known as a serology DNA bag. It's a Tyvek white like envelope that all the samples um, are packaged in, and that will get forwarded to me as the DNA analyst. So when I'm ready to, be, to begin the DNA process, I have all the samples kind of already prepared for me. The note taking has already been completed. And that's what she, that was her purpose in this case, correct? Yes. All right. And did you receive from her submission 17, two blood standards from Sean Henry? Yes, I did. Um, and when I, when we talk about these and when I say, did you receive the blood standards? Did you receive, um, you know, the swabs? You then receive all that and then you begin your process of extracting DNA and then go through the five steps for us, correct? Correct. All right, submission um, 18. Did you receive um, 
18A, glove A, and 18B, glove B, swabbings from those. Correct. Okay. And let me, if I could approach, showing you what's uh, been admitted into evidence as space number 310. Do you recognize this? Um, uh, there's another label on this particular item. Uh, yes, so this label is uh, what our evidence unit would put on items of evidence that come into the PBSO evidence unit. Okay, and it's the white one and it says submission, Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office submission 18, correct? Yes. Do you then use this submission number in your reports? Yes, that's how um, all items will be referred to, okay. their submission number. So we have information from Jupiter Police Department that says a pair of dark covered Gloves uh, collected by T. Bryant on 2 6 at 9 49 a.m. And then you have your submission number 18, correct? Yes. So a pair of gloves collected the day after the homicide by Teresa Bryant in the morning time, right? Let's talk, um, first of all, let me go back and let's just begin to go through the results this way. Did you extract a DNA profile from Sean Henry's uh, blood standard? Yes, I did. And um, did you, was it a full profile because it's a standard, correct? Yes. All right. And the gloves, let's talk about submission 18, the one that I just showed, glove A and glove B. Did you receive swabbings from those gloves? May I refer to my report? Sure, and you'll do that oftentimes, correct? Referring to your report. Um, do you have very specific notes in your bench notes as well as your results that you will give us for accuracy purposes? Yes. Go ahead, please. So for glove um, 18A, which was named glove A, um, I received swabs from the wrist area um, and I conducted the DNA analysis on that particular set of swabs. Okay, and can you tell us what your DNA results were from um, that glove 18A from the wrist areas? So a DNA profile is obtained from the wrist area um, and indicates the presence of two individuals. So it was a DNA mixture and it indicated two individuals um, from that sample. Uh, um, Throughout this process, though, and, and first of all, I'm sorry, let me back up. Did you obtain submission 20 DNA oral standards from a Charles Warpagel? Yes, I did. Submission 21 DNA standards from Vasada, Christopher Vasada? Yes, I did. So we have Sean Henry in this round of DNA testing, Charles Warpagel, Chris Vasada, correct? Yes, those were the reference standards that I received for this round of testing. And um, let me show you what we will mark as, um, they have been marked as 325, 326. I've shown Ms. Ramsey. Are you familiar with some specifics? Uh, yes, these are, um, we refer to them as allele summary tables. They summarize the results of the, the electropharograms that we showed. Um, yes, I recognize these. And are these your work in this case, or just a, a, a one faction of your work in this case? Yes. And would this help illustrate and explain some of the DNA results to the jury? Yes. Statements 325 and 326 into evidence. Any objection? No. Admitted. Let's look at three, which one first, 326 or 325? This one. 326. Sorry. Just take us through generally. We're not going to do this for every piece of evidence, but take us through what this exhibit shows. And this is the actual work in this case, correct? Yes. So this is the um, results for 18A-1, the wrist area of the glove um, we were just um, speaking about. Um, so this is our, we call it an allele summary table. We kind of saw it in the presentation. Uh, the colored side, these are those GPS locations um, that we are looking at for 
the genetic information. So looking at this profile, the first thing I do is evaluate the profile. Is it from one person or two? So going down the profile, it looks to be from uh, one person, but then we get to these markers down here, those particular areas, um, and I see I have, ooh, I'm sorry. Um, I have three pieces of information. So because I have three pieces of information, that's actually indicative it's a mixture. Um, so there are two individuals contributing to this profile. Um, alleles or the pieces of information that are in black are much higher. So if we think of the example of the drops of blood and contributing, um, the black information is much, much higher than that, uh, those two little pieces of red. So I know I have someone there that's contributing a whole bunch to this DNA profile. Correct. Okay. And just for one, the, AM, the AML, it was a male, right? Next slide. Yes, so there's actually two um, sex identifying markers in this profile. So we have amylogenin. Um, we also have this particular marker here. Um, it's known as DYS391, specific to the male chromosome. So if I have a result there, it's another indication it's a male sample. DNA profile from the glove. Did you uh, match that against um, the three standards? Sean Henry, Chris uh, Vasada, and Charles Vorpagel. Yes, so I went through the comparison process and I determined that Christopher Vastata cannot be excluded as a contributor to that major DNA profile. The probability of selecting an unrelated individual at random as having that same major profile would be more rare than one in 300 billion individuals. Uh, Sean Henry and Charles Vorpalga are excluded as contributors to this major DNA profile. And as an example, So um, 325, these are the known samples or those reference samples that were submitted from the um, three individuals that I had standards for. So each column is a different individual. Up there, I believe that's submission 17, um, tw 20, 17, 20, 20, 20. Yes, sorry. So the submission numbers are up there. Again, our um, markers, markers that we're looking at, the GPS locations are over here, and then these are the reference profiles for each of those individuals. And the 40 or 17 is? Uh, I believe 17 was Sean Henry. Okay, and then 20? Was Charles uh, Vorpagel. And 21? Uh, Christopher Vastata. Uh, yes, there were several other standards that were submitted. Eventually, we'll go through those. But in looking at Vasada's DNA profile, his known DNA profile from his cheek swab, that's mm -hmm. over here on 21, correct? Yes. And then as an example, if we take the known and Love. Take us through how it is that you are comparing and making the determination of a profile on that glove with the statistic of more than one in 300 billion being associated with the side. Go ahead. Oops. Thank you. Uh, so looking at, you have the unknown um, item of evidence. The swab from the glove is on the left-hand side of the screen. And then you have the reference standard on the column on the right side. So what I would do is look at the item of evidence. Um, I do know there's a major contributor. I would have an additional sheet of a mixture deconvolution where I would pull out um, 
the individual that's contributing more. So looking on the electropharogram, they're visibly higher, so I can determine that they are the major contributor, and that's what I'm going to compare to. So going through at D3, I have a, um, 15. That is the piece of information in the unknown item of evidence. Comparing to a standard, the standard is also 15. So going down to the next one, um, I think that's a... Uh, Watch your steps. So we have Asana's profile here, correct? It is no profile and then the glove over here. Yes. Um, so at D1 here, uh, the unknown item of evidence is 11, 15.3. Those are the pieces of information on one person. Um, so at the standard, the standard has the same information. So going down here at this particular marker, D2, um, the, the evidence, 11.314, the standard, also 11.314. So I continue this process through the entire unknown profile for that major contributor and um, determine that I could not exclude this standard, so there were no differences um, between the evidence and uh, the reference standard. Um, you called, um, so we, first of all, it's number one, it's a mixture because further down, you only have, you have, it looks like just two extra pieces of information, right? Right, so here, the 19 and the 15. There's two additional pieces of information that it is two people. Um, however, two pieces of information is, is not really enough to make a comparison um, for this profile. So that second person, do I compare to that second person? And I've determined, no, I will not compare to this uh, because it's too much dropout. There's too much information missing for me to make a comparison to those two pieces of information. You mean a comparison of the second person. You've already yes. made a comparison to Christopher Masada, right? Right. Um, that profile is in black. I would have another sheet that would separate out that mixture, similar to the coin separation. So I separate out the two people. So one, there's enough information to compare. That second one, it's only two pieces um, that's um, determined to be inconclusive. Too much, there's a little dropout, too much information is missing. Right, in other words, we have a lot of information on, on all these other markers, except that, that match the side, correct? Correct. But then you just have two little pieces and there's not enough if you separated it out, 19 and 15, not being Fasada, you're just left with two pieces of information versus all of that, correct? Correct, and I would have made that determination before any okay. uh, comparing to the references. But because of those two pieces of information, you have to call it a mixture. It's a mixture. It, is Christopher Fasada the major contributor? Correct. He could not be excluded as the major contributor. All right, and you can go ahead now and have it see. Um, and then we go to the last step. Now that you've done all of that, how significant is this though? How significant is this match? So for this profile, conducted that random match probability. And um, so Christopher Vasada could not be excluded as a contributor to that major DNA profile. The probability of selecting an unrelated um, individual at random um, as having that same profile, the same one that we went through, would be more rare than one in 300 billion individuals. Okay, we talked about how many people in the world presently are, how many? Um, I believe it was 7.5 billion. So, um, John Henry and Poor Pagel were excluded as having possibly contributed to that swap from that glove, correct? To the major contributor, correct. And the swabbings were from the wrist area of the glove, correct? Correct. One of the gloves. And then, um, any results from the other uh, parts of the glove? Glove B, I'm sorry. Let's go to glove B. There were two gloves, so let's go to 18B. Uh, so a DNA profile was obtained from the outer glove. Um, those were swabs that were submitted to me and indicated the presence of three individuals. And um, tell us what your results were on those. Uh, so for those results, a major uh, male profile was deduced. Um, so similar to this one, I was able to visually see there was a major profile. 
um, Sean Henry, Charles Vorpagel, and Christopher Vastada were excluded as contributors to that major profile. Correct. And Starmix is relevant to mixtures, right? Correct. So in March of 2017, we have mixtures, but we didn't have the benefit of Starmix yet, right? Correct. In your later reports in which Starmix now became a board of Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office and we asked you to rerun some of these samples, are we now going to be getting additional results on some of these March uh, testimony we're talking about? Yes, so several profiles. Um, we have, uh, for mixture deconvolutions, we had guidelines of how um, to break apart a mixture um, based on mathematical principles and our validation studies. Sometimes profiles did not meet those. There weren't enough markers um, or there was imbalance and it couldn't account for that. So there's, uh, we reported um, no comparisons will be conducted because I cannot do a statistic at this time. Later on, um, I reanalyzed some of the samples that I couldn't do statistics simply because I didn't have that tool. Um, I reanalyzed it with Starmix because that now I could, I did have that tool to provide a statistic and make comparisons. Okay, so I think the easiest way though is to just go through date by date and give the results you got on that date and then we'll begin to see how it evolved and you got more results at a so we talked about glove A, we talked about glove B. Um, you, you actually tested two areas of glove B for DNA, correct? Yes. Uh, 18B1, which you just gave us your results, and 18B2, what did that, what were those results? Uh, so 18B2 were swabs from the inner glove, the inside of the glove, and it indicated the presence of at least two individuals. Again, I deduced a major profile, and Sean Henry, Charles Borpagel, and Christopher Vastata were excluded as contributors to that major profile. Okay. Let's then go to submission 19A, which are, 19A is uh, characterized as swabs from the back left interior door handle, and it's a Honda. Go ahead and tell us what your results of that were. A DNA profile was obtained and indicates the presence of three individuals. No DNA data eligible for statistical calculation was developed for this mixture, and as a result, comparisons for inclusions and exclusions will not be performed. So that means I have a mixture. I don't have the statistical tools at my disposal at this time um, to provide any sort of statistic for an inclusion, or um, and so at this time I will not be making um, comparisons of inclusions or exclusions. So if individuals are included in that mixture or excluded. And when you say at this time, do you mean in March of 2017? Yes. Okay. So when you're testifying, I'm not going to be making any conclusions at this time. You're talking about in March of 2017. Correct. And I'm going to specifically delineate each report as we go through. So, um, submission 19B, swaps from a steering wheel of a Honda. In March of 2017, what were your results? So a DNA profile was obtained and it indicates three individuals, um, but I could not do any statistical calculations on that particular mixture, um, so no comparisons were made at that time. from a blood-like substance number three at the crime scene. Tell us what your results were on that. So this was, um, a DNA profile was obtained, it indicates one person, one individual. Um, a Christopher Vastada cannot be excluded as a contributor to the DNA profile obtained. The probability of selecting an unrelated individual at random as having the same DNA profile would be more rare than one in 300 billion individuals. Uh, Sean Henry and Charles Vorpega, they were excluded as contributors to this profile. So uh, the substance or the swab that was labeled blood-like substance number three at the crime scene was a single source profile. What does that mean? Uh, it comes from one individual. And it was blood, correct? Or what do you know about it? Uh, blood-like substance? It was labeled blood-like substance. Okay. And that single source profile was the DNA profile of Christopher Vasada, correct? Correct. He could not be excluded. Just like there, on all of the location markers, Christopher Masada's DNA profile was consistent, was the same, 
correct? Correct. Submission 19B, swabs from a blood-like substance number two in the Honda. Um, so a DNA profile is obtained and indicates the presence of two individuals. Um, Christopher Vastada cannot be excluded as a contributor to that major DNA profile. So again, it was a mixture, but there was someone contributing more that I could pull out a major profile. And who was the major profile? Uh, Christopher Vastada could not be excluded. And what were the statistics on that major profile of the blood-like substance number two in the Honda? So the probability of selecting an unrelated individual at random as having that same major DNA profile would be more rare than one in 300 billion individuals. Sean Henry and Charles Vorpalgo are excluded as contributors to this major DNA profile. So due to excessive allele dropout of the minor profile, that um, the, the smaller portion of the profile, um, the results are not suitable for comparison and uh, no comparisons were conducted. It just means that there's not enough genetic information really to make a comparison. It's similar to this profile with one, two pieces of information. It's, it's not enough to make a comparison. I would, it's possible, um, but the ha there's a lot of factors that would determine if I could generate a profile from a year ago. Um, so there is time, that's quite a long time, but also the storage conditions. So if everything was optimal, maybe the temperature was perfect, nobody touched it, no one cleaned it, it's possible. If, the, if it's preserved in optimal conditions, no, because we can get DNA profiles from uh, items of evidence that are decades old. And the more specific uh, involved the DNA gets, the more specific, in other words, the ability to pick up more information from the DNA that touched Yes, the sensitivity of our kits are, uh, I believe we can get a full DNA profile from, I want to say 50 cells if I remember correctly. So very small amounts of cellular material, we can get a DNA profile. Uh, let's talk about um, submission 22A, where you given objection Sure. Going back to submission 22A, uh, swab from trigger guard, um, it's your submission 22A, swab from trigger guard submission number three, uh, 357 Magnum. Did you receive a um, result on that? A DNA profile is obtained, it indicates the presence of at least two individuals. No DNA was eligible for a statistic at that time, um, so comparisons for inclusions or exclusions will, will not be performed. And how about submission 22B, swaps from the front site, submission number 3, 357 Magnum? So a DNA profile was obtained, but due to excessive allele dropout, so missing information, uh, the results were not suitable for comparative analysis, and comparisons for inclusions or exclusions will not be performed. A DNA profile was obtained and indicates at least three individuals, um, but due to excessive allele dropout, so again, there's not enough information, uh, the results are not suitable for comparative analysis and comparisons for inclusions and exclusions will not be performed. Submission 23A swaps from the trigger guard, submission four of the block. A DNA, a DNA profile was obtained and indicates the presence of at least two individuals. 
Due to excessively little dropout, results are not suitable for comparative analysis and comparisons for inclusions and exclusions will not be performed. And this was your language back in March of 2017, correct? Yes, if I've deemed something as excessive allele dropout, there's not enough information to compare no matter the tools I have at my disposal. An insufficient amount of DNA was detected during quantification, so step two. So I didn't, um, I didn't obtain enough information to continue on in the processing, so the sample was not processed any further. Submission 23C, swabs from the frame, the slide, submission four, block. An insufficient amount of DNA was detected during quantification, and the sample was not processed any further. A DNA profile is obtained and indicates the presence of two individuals, but due to excessive allele dropout, results are not suitable for comparative analysis and comparisons um, for inclusions and exclusions will not be conducted. Submission 25A, swabs from Glock pistol magazine submission 10. A DNA profile is obtained and indicates the presence of three individuals. Um, Christopher Vastada cannot be excluded as a contributor to that major DNA profile that I was able to deduce. The probability of selecting an unrelated individual at random as having the same major DNA profile would be more rare than one in 300 billion individuals. And, um, I'm sorry, just to go back, that's, uh, we talked about submissions Uh, so the description that I received was swabs from Glock Pistol Magazine Submission 10. And um, the results were a mixture, is that correct? Yes, it was a mixture of three individuals. And who was the major profile on that mixture? Uh, Christopher Vasada could not be excluded as a contributor to that major DNA profile. probability of selecting an unrelated individual at random as having that same major DNA profile would be more rare than one in 300 billion individuals. Sean Henry and Charles Vorpagel are excluded as contributors to this major DNA profile. And then in uh, your next um, conclusion on that item, the uh, so no DNA data was eligible for a statistical calculation on the minor contributors of this mixture. Um, so I will not, do, I would not do comparisons for inclusions or exclusions at this time. Um, submission 27A, swabs from Rifle Magazine, which is submission number 13 in parentheses. A DNA profile was obtained and indicates the presence of at least two individuals. Due to excessive allele dropout, the results are not suitable for comparison and uh, comparative analysis and comparisons for inclusions and exclusions will not be performed. Is that the same as, let me just now try to consolidate some of them, that um, result from the swaps from the rifle magazine that you just stated, did you find the same results from submission 28A, swaps from the trigger guard of that rifle submission 14, as well as 28 from the frame and receiver of that same item. 28A um, was at least three individuals, so it's slightly different, but the same conclusion. There was too much um, genetic information missing to make a comparison. Uh, 28B, it was uh, three individuals, um, but there was information there I would compare to, I just did not have a statistical tool at the time uh, to make any sort of comparisons and provide a statistic if um, there were individuals that could not be excluded. So those are slightly different. Oh, you're right. And is that 28B, the swap from the frame and receiver of the rifle magazine, is that one of the items that then you were able to use to start an exploit that we'll talk about later? Yes. And um, 28C, 
thoughts from the rifle magazine deficient for teeth? An insufficient, a, an insufficient amount of DNA was detected during quantification, so the sample was not processed further. Yes. And go ahead um, and tell us what additional items of DNA or did you receive that are different from the March 21st, 2017 report? We're now at July 13th, 2017. We have the same submission 17. We have Sean Henry. Yes. Submission 18, gloves A and B, we talked about. Yes. Um, 19. Talked about the swabs from the inside the Honda. You had the oral standard from Borpegel, the oral standard from the SADA. We talked about submission 25, <coughs> correct? Yes. Which were 20, 25A, sorry, yes. 25A, the swabs from the Glock pistol magazine. What's new next? Submission 38 and 39. What are those? 38 and 39 were two additional standards that were submitted. Submission 38 um, was two blood standards from um, El Sahi, uh, comma Brandy, it's Brandy El, El Sahi. Uh, submission 39, two blood standards from Dougherty Kelly J. And then um, submission 41, that was not on in, during March of 2017. What was submission? Submission 41 was labeled as the black t-shirt from the front uh, R seat of the Honda. Okay. Uh, you received swabs from that? I did, correct. It went through this, uh, the serology process. So the physical item was received, the serologist collected items, uh, swabbings, and then I received the swabbings. And your serologist was the process, Yes, I believe she was the serologist for this round as well. Uh, submission 42. Black hoodie. Submission 43. Puma sock. And um, submission 44. Black t shirt from the back L seat of Honda. And then submission 45. So, submission 45 were three items. They were swabbings that were submitted. Uh, so, we have 45A, swabs from the pink backpack in the BMW. 45B, swabs from the rifle bag and ha rifle bag handles. 45C, swabs from the rifle bag body. All right, pause there. The jurors are giving me the sign that they would like a break. So we're going to take a short break. Just the jury rooms, okay? All right. And it's, we have an issue we have to take up anyhow. We were waiting to break, so that's perfect. Ten minutes. Put your pads upside down. Don't talk about the case. Don't do any research. While they're shuffling out, can I see the lawyers at the bench? Please. I think Ms. Howard, you might want to come. Oh, wonderful. That was perfect timing. Great. Can I rest the rest of us? Yes, the rest of us are going to take a break. Well, and ma'am, you uh, can go use the restroom, whatever. You, just don't talk about your, the case right now because you're in the middle of your testimony, okay? And watch your step coming through here. Thank you.